is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com as we are getting you set for week number 13 of college football with Ian Cameron. You can find his work uh, at the Sportsbook Review and also at VEASAN, and we'll be breaking down college football, college basketball, NHL. We'll get a little uh, a little bit of Grey Cup talk in there as well, so looking forward to bringing Ian in in just a bit. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com and at the Power Rank on Twitter. Ed, your Michigan Wolverines pulling out the offense last week. So how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, it was a pretty exceptional game. Uh, that was pretty good, although not as, you know, uh, not as exceptional as the, the margin of victory that Northwestern oh, put up last weekend against Massachusetts. I think okay, so how impressive were bookmakers for that game? Because, like, I feel like that'd be such a difficult game to diagnose if you were a bookmaker. And the total was around, you know, between 38 and 40, depending on when you got it. And yeah. Northwestern won that game by almost exactly that number. Like, right. it's it's kind of amazing how that works out. Yeah, I mean, you know, my number had it right about 39 as well. Yeah. So I uh, was pretty happy with, with kind of how that turned out. But, you know, Northwestern has this unique opportunity to follow that up with a statement oh, win over Minnesota this week. In a game yeah. that actually doesn't matter in the grand scheme of the Big Ten West. <laughs> so you can That's catch true. them napping, take home a scalp, and, 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 you know, <laughs> kind of salvage the season for the Northwestern Wildcats. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> uh, Pat Fitzgerald had his press conference this week, and he basically said nobody on this team is prepared to play quarterback right now, which is A, correct, but B, <laughs> the most blunt assessment I have ever heard a coach give of his own team in my entire life. He's right, but I've never heard a coach say that, and it was, like, wild to me. So... Uh, they're they're 13 and a half point dogs at home. It seems about right. I grew up in Minnesota, which means that until like eighth grade, I was I was a Golden Gopher fan. Right. And then in eighth grade, I was like, oh, I want to go to Northwestern. And so I became a Northwestern fan. So like this is like my two teams kind of like right. from when I was growing up competing. And like I'm going to root for Northwestern, but like at least at least there's like a minor hedge where I can like cheer up seventh grade gym if they do lose. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really my my ideal is that Northwestern wins this week, and then Minnesota beats Wisconsin the next week, which would push my, you know, Wisconsin nine win under nine wins, which yep. you know would basically be a miracle push given how they started the season. Yeah. Um. So that's what I'm hoping for. There is actually still a scenario in which Illinois plays in the Big Ten championship game against Ohio State, which I would find to be the most hilarious thing that's ever happened. So I kind of want that to happen. I'm rooting for chaos. That's all I yeah. can say. Well, I just want know, the Illinois chaos. Went from a 12 to 15 and a half point dog uh, at Iowa this week. Miracles can happen, Ed. That's all I will say. <laughs> so we're going to bring in Ian Cameron in just one second. As mentioned, you can find all his work at Sportsbook Review and at Vison. He also has a Patreon uh, called The Ice Guys, breaking down NHL. Uh, you can find that on his Twitter page, at B-O-B-A-N-O. We'll talk with Ian about Week 13 of college football. We'll talk a couple of big conference games there. And, of course, some college basketball, hockey, and the Grey Cup. To make sure you get that podcast uh, to our, our NFL podcast tomorrow as well, make sure you subscribe to covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts and while you're there please leave a rating and review as well because those do help us out a ton uh, nfl podcast will be up at the regular time tomorrow talking with donnie seymour about week 12 of the nfl but before we bring on ian we have to go back to last week's show we have to go through our college football picks and we had an mvp bet close last week for co- for baseball and it wound up being closer than it should have been so we'll break that down in just one second Covering the past. All right, last week here on Covering the Spread on the College Football Edition, we had Ed on to talk about what his numbers had for the week. We mentioned a lean on Auburn plus three, but you said the line is pretty efficient. Uh, Georgia did win in cover there, just a lean. Uh, we had mentioned the under on Michigan versus Michigan State at 44. Michigan won that game 44 to 10, so that, did, that game did go over, and Ed, it was kind of what we had talked about before. You talked about how the ground game works one week, the passing game works the next week. This time it was back to Shea Patterson. Uh, what did you see in that game from Michigan? Yeah, I mean, I 
I, and we'll talk about this in covering the future too. I mean, I mean, Michigan's passing game had an exceptional week. I mean, even if they would have played like uh, we had expected it to all year, um, and the numbers were remarkable in that game, and 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 no one here in Ann Arbor, I mean, everyone kind of in Ann Arbor agrees. You know, this is kind of the dream game that you play in a rivalry game. And so, yeah, I think it was an exceptional performance by Michigan. Uh, you know, didn't help out uh, being under uh, the 44 points there. You know, I think I think Michigan State's offense did exactly what I thought they would do against right. Michigan's defense, but it didn't work out on the other side of the ball. So, so there's that. I think the process of the bet was correct because Michigan State's offense, like you said, did exactly what you expected, and you needed a Shea Patterson freakout day in order for that game no. to go over, and you got it. Like well, you get, you get, you get oh, yeah, oh, freak out day to go over. Yeah, yeah. Right. I thought you were talking and, about, like, freak out, like, bad. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, no, you need I mean, a shape. We just needed like, them to perform at what they had performed all year for right. oh, to be, like, a 23 to a 10 kind of win or a 20 to 10 kind of win. Right. Um, but that's not that's not the way it turned out. Yeah, and said you got a 95th percentile day out of Shea Patterson, and I'm sure the, the people around you will be very happy about that, even if uh, it yeah. did wind up going in the over. I had the over on Clemson versus Wake Forest at 59 and a half. There were only 20 points in that game with a couple of minutes left before halftime, and I gave up on it at that point. Uh, it did get kind of close. Uh, the, the final score was 52 to 3. Clemson scored twice to put it at 34 points at the half. Uh, then they, they really came out firing in the second half. So they scored 52. Wake Forest had three. I had too much faith in the Wake Forest offense, uh, bluntly. Um, I was hoping for just one touchdown out of them, basically. That never happened. Um, you know, Clemson, I, I think that maybe I need to give more faith to their defense. I like their defense a lot, but I thought the Wake Forest offense could do something here. Um, so... The process may not have been correct. I may have been overvaluing the Wake Forest offense, but it did at least get close, so I felt a little bit better about it at the end of the day. But Clemson's offense, man, like, they just keep torching people now. I know Wake Forest isn't good, and they haven't played many good defenses, but is it enough where you are changing your view of this Clemson offense given how much they struggled at the beginning of the year? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they've looked good. Um, I mean, I did a little bit. I talked a little bit about Trevor Lawrence when when I looked at the their college playoff odds, mm-hmm. and I think what a lot of people um, thought was that he was being a little too aggressive, and that's what some of the turnovers came in yeah. early. Uh, but it, but it's it, you know, the, a lot of you know by completion percentage, by yards per completion, you know, those numbers are all better than they were last year, and and you can kind of figure out. I mean, I guess you kind of have to compare. Uh, the competition as well, but yeah, I mean the Clemson offense looks like like they're they're good and not yeah. no, not good but great. What you expect out of of an offense led by Trevor Lawrence and you know I'm I'm definitely putting you know I'm expecting Clemson to be there not only make the playoff but like contend for another title. Exactly, and I think that you phrased it correctly. Where like you know we need to you know, look at things the way that things are changed and be willing to have faith in them once again. They were a good offense earlier in the year, but they've become a great one recently. The other thing we had here for Covering the Past was actually from our first episode of Covering the Past or uh, of Covering the Spread. We talked, or I talked, about Alex Bregman as a potential AL MVP winner. At the time, he was 13-1 to to win the MVP award, and Mike Trout was, I think, like minus something insane. Um... And th- part of the thought process was, it's July, we don't know what Mike Trout's health is going to be the rest of the way, because he was actually dinged up at the time, and Mike Trout did wind up getting hurt in September, but he had lasted long enough where he had built a, a big enough cushion where his gap between Bregman and him was big enough, where Bregman couldn't overcome it, uh, but Bregman did finish second in the AL MVP voting. He had uh, 13 first place votes. And he also had um, uh, 335 total points in the voting, whereas Trout had 355. So it wound up being really close. And I feel good about getting him at 13 to 1, obviously, given how close yeah. it was. And I also feel pretty good at the process. So I was happy with this one, Ed. I was really hoping he would pull it out. I didn't think he deserved it. I thought that Trout did deserve it. And like, if I were a voter, I right. would have voted for Mike Trout. But I was pretty happy with how things played out there. Yeah, for sure. And, and I mean... I think, especially when you're looking at futures, the best you can hope for is that your process is right and that you hit, you know, one in 10 of those types of bets, right? right? 
Exactly. And we'll talk about another one in Covering the Future later today with some longer odds we can hope for in April. If you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, or Indiana. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's bring on Ian Cameron now. Again, find him on Twitter at B-O-B-A-N-O. You can find his work at The Ice Guys on Patreon and also t- talking NHL there and also on Sportsbook Review and VSIM. Let's bring out Ian to talk a little Grey Cup and get you set for week, week 13 of college football. Covering the present. Let's bring Ian Cameron on into covering the spread. Ian, it is a hyper busy time of year for you. Your Hamilton Tiger Cats are in the Grey Cup this weekend. So thank you for taking time. How are you doing today? Doing great, guys. Good to be on the show with you. And yeah, if you're uh, not busy in November, I don't know what you're doing with your time if you're in this uh, type of line of work. Yeah, it's insane. I, I've gotten very lucky because I do a lot of golf and NASCAR, and those are both winding down now. So I feel very lucky, but we're going to talk to you about the NHL, college basketball. But before we do that, you have, if you're watching the video version, you can see that Ian has the Hamilton Proud sign hanging up behind him for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. They're facing Winnipeg. Um, so I want to hear your fan perspective on it, but also from a betting perspective, any lean on this game for the Grey Cup this weekend? It's It should be a great game, guys, because I thought Hamilton and Winnipeg was going to be probably a good chance to be uh, the Grey Cup before the season began. Uh, Calgary Stampeders have been the team that have really dominated the Western Division for years. I thought they were a little bit vulnerable, a little bit down from where they've been, especially on defense, and it proved uh, to be the case. They lost to this Winnipeg team in the Western semifinal uh, a couple of weeks ago, and Hamilton's been the class of the CFL, and I'm not saying that as a homer. I'm saying that because it's a fact. Uh, they're 15-3 and three on the season, uh, the best record in the CFL, probably the most complete team in the league, offense, defense, special teams. An amazing job to get to this point, guys, considering Jeremiah Masoli, their number one quarterback, went down to injury early in the season. I know the Ticat fans around me, friends of mine, panicking, saying our season's over or I'll be, because we thought we could get to the Great Cup before the season, but now Masoli's injured. How are we going to get there now? And I said, calm down. I know our backup. I know him well. He was a great college quarterback. I made a lot of money backing his Tulsa teams and betting a lot of overs years ago. Mr. Dane Evans, under his tutelage at the quarterback spot, we would be just fine. And sure enough, here's Dane Evans taking over, I believe, in week four of the season. And he's been tremendous for us at the quarterback position. He's taken hold of the offense. Uh, He's found great chemistry with his receivers. A great offensive line has given him protection Uh, to throw the football downfield uh, all season long. We've got a great defense. The defensive line, I think, is the best in the CFL, can get after the quarterback. Uh, And we've just been able to ride that, uh, both sides of the ball, getting to this great cup game. And uh, it's just been a a well-coached team with Orlando Steinauer. Winnipeg's a really good team, too. I mean, their offense, they lost their quarterback early in the season, Matt Nichols. Uh, They went with Chris Strevler, uh, although his passing ability is sort of Uh, negligible it's not great so they went out and got Zach Kolaros who was a former Hamilton Tiger Cat years ago and actually was with Saskatchewan to begin this season but they cut him because he's been an injury plagued guy over the years he's had one injury after another hasn't been able to stay healthy but Winnipeg picked him up and he's played really good in just what two three starts for Winnipeg since they got him and here he is starting against his former team in the Grey Cup so great storyline there should be a great football game we've got Hamilton what three three and a half point favorite in this game right now total 51 and a half Uh, I think with the way these two teams have moved the ball and the way both teams can score on defense and special teams they're really good on those two phases of the game as well I think I would go over the total in this one I think you'll see some points I think I'm not going in front of Hamilton because they've been the far superior team all year in this league they're 2-0 and against Winnipeg head-to-head this year as well but you know Winnipeg's been great in the underdog role 8-1 and against the spread so that's why I'm a little bit leery of laying points against Winnipeg when they've been just a cash cow as an underdog uh, all season so I think Hamilton wins in the three to six point range and, and the game will go over the total and it's on ESPN too I, I tell you guys check it out it should be a really good CFL Grey Cup title game that's awesome so Ian it's it's obviously a busy time for you CFL Grey Cup uh, not to mention NFL, college football, college basketball just started, and you're a big NHL guy as well. Tell me about your process this time of year in figuring out all of these sports. 
Yeah, uh, and it was one of those situations for me where, you know, I've been in, in doing this for seven years now, and it got to the point up to about a couple of years ago, especially as media responsibilities add up, article responsibilities that you got to write and put together for various publications add up uh, in recent years. It got to this point of the year where I tried to be jack of all trades. I tried to be wear all kinds of different hats, you know, pro in college football, pro in college basketball, hockey. Try to do it all at this time of year. And I got to the point two years ago where I got to cut something out of the rotation. There's just not enough hours in the day, not enough hours and time available to adequately and accurately handicap all these sports. So uh, NBA regular season is what ended up biting the dust for me. Uh, I just, you know, I had to push it to one side. There's uh, too much going on with both footballs. Uh, college basketball, which Ed, you know very well, it's very intensive keeping up with college basketball uh, right. and hockey uh, at this time of year. So uh, NBA regular season, cutting that out has really been the crux of me streamlining my process, really, is eliminating that one sport. Now, I do bet and handicap NBA at playoff time, and I do that because it's April. You know, and there's a lot more time available at that time. You've got just NBA playoffs, which is only a few games, NHL Stanley Cup playoffs, which is only a few games. You know, college basketball season is over by that time. Uh, MLB is just starting, uh, and it's not, you know, loaded card on a daily basis. So I've got the time where I think I can put in to making good plays and make doing good making good handicapping decisions when it comes to NBA playoffs but my streamlined process has been eliminate NBA regular season keep everything else at this time of year and it's been uh, working out well and it's beneficial to know where your strengths are. And I think identifying where you want to cut down, I think that uh, having that self-awareness is definitely a key. Let's talk about the NHL a bit because we haven't gotten to talk a whole lot of NHL on the show. Uh, we talked a little bit about it earlier in the year, but how have things been going for you so far in the NHL? And what are some things that think that give you an edge as a better when it comes to the NHL? Yeah, early in the season, certainly you have some up opinions of teams that will improve, teams that will regress from last year. We really go uh, with a lot of those, and some of those have been working out well uh, so far this season. You look at you know a team like the Edmonton Oilers. I was able to cash in with them last night. They're a surprise team for sure. This was a brutal hockey team last year. They changed the coach. Uh, Dave Tippett's there now. Uh, largely the same personnel, which is interesting because that's the same personnel that was not a very good team last year, but the coach comes in, uh, uh, implements more of a defensive strategy, structure you know stress is playing much better defense which that Edmonton team had to do you know last year and they weren't able to so just being able to pinpoint those teams that have improved uh, and sort of regressed that's been thing totals are a very uh, profitable endeavor for me when it comes to NHL riding total streaks look at the Washington Capitals uh, they were recently on a what 13 and one over the total streak in the last 14 games betting markets and odds makers are asleep at that at this time of year because they don't put as much time into hockey there's no way they do you know they're they're worried about nfl college football nba college basketball it's a busy time of year so this washington capital over the total run really flew under the radar and not really noticed or picked up on by odds makers and i'm able to capitalize on that total streaks are something that are really uh something that i Really can and there's teams every year in this league where you can ride them either over or under games on end and there's very little adjustment made uh, in the short term. Interesting. And we talked about how it's tough for us this time of year to focus on everything, but it's tough for the books too. And I think that's a good point that you made there with regards to the NHL because you're right. Like they're not going to prioritize that over all the other sports. It definitely does help this time of year. Now we're all stuck in college basketball here, and we've got a couple weeks of data on each team right now, and that's significant. Uh, which teams for you have deviated the most heavily from your prior? What you expected going into the year with those teams? And do you expect those deviations to continue going forward? Well, from a disappointing standpoint, a team that I thought was going to be better and certainly so far hasn't. In fact, it's been a disaster compared to what I thought they would be coming out of the gate. It's Texas San Antonio. I know that team's not going to, uh, you know, be it's not a, it's not North Carolina or a Duke or a power <laughs> conference team, but we talk about every college basketball team, and I handicap every uh, college basketball team. And UTSA has been a huge disappointment. They brought a tremendous backcourt uh, onto this team, a team that was able to score the basketball. Well, their offensive efficiency has been lousy this season. Their defense has been non-existent. Uh, they were absolutely plowed and just and blown out multiple times, including by Oklahoma, uh, to begin the season. Uh, this is a Texas San Antonio team. Uh, it's not just me. There's a people that I respect that are college basketball betters and handicappers as well that really thought the Roadrunners would be an improved team. That hasn't happened. 0-5 this season. I don't believe they've covered a number this year. If they have, it's been one at most. Uh, it's just been a very disappointing team. Now, what I, how I handle a team like this is, you know, when I'm wrong – 
once or twice with them betting on them and I lose, I'll just leave them alone, let them try to work things out, see if there's a, a t- an uptick on the horizon with a team like that. It hasn't happened yet, but I think some a point that I want to stress out to people watching here is that – and this you're going to see this every year in college basketball. Every year, it doesn't – without fail, this happens. You're going to see a team get absolutely crushed in non-conference play. You know, that they look terrible. They have a horrible record. January, late December rolls around conference play, and that team suddenly transforms into something totally different. And all of a sudden, something clicks. You know, familiarity, opponents that they're used to playing. And all of a sudden, that team that was lousy in non-conference play is completely devalued from a point spread perspective come conference season, and they go on a tremendous point spread run. So we could have a situation like this with UTSA. Maybe once they get back into their CUSA season, you know, in December and January, look out, maybe this team after getting, you know, roughed up and bashed against the wall here in non-conference play to begin the season, watch them go on maybe an eight and two ATS run to open conference play. I've seen these kind of examples countless times and it happens year after year. It's it's about finding out which teams those are. And if you do that, that's a good strategy I look for. So when conference season rolls around, Get all that struggle early in the season out of your system, and then all of a sudden be a value-laden point spread team. That sounds good. So, Ian, we brought you on here uh, mostly to talk about some college football games. Uh, we got a big one, Penn State going to Ohio State. Ohio State's been particularly impressive this year. They're eight and a half, 18, excuse me, 18 and a half point favorite in this game. Uh, Penn State uh, has been good, but maybe not so much in the last couple of weeks. Total at 57. Um, what, what are you seeing in this game? What I'm seeing is I've got concerns for that Penn State defense coming into this game. I mean, you look at the last two weeks, guys. Indiana's yeah. moving the ball up and down the field against them. Peyton Ramsey uh, was tremendous at the quarterback spot. They're able to run the football uh, pretty effectively, the Hoosiers, in that game. Uh, Penn State had opportunities to pull away, and that defense didn't give them the stop to allow them to pull away in that game, which I'm happy about because I took Indiana plus the points last week in a spot that I was very concerned about for Penn State after uh, losing to Minnesota the previous week. Uh, And then, of course, the aforementioned Minnesota game. I mean, that Penn State defense was shredded really by uh, Tanner Morgan uh, through the air. Uh, by the running game, which was absolutely terrific uh, as well for Minnesota. It was that balanced offense. The P- Penn State defensive line was bullied a little bit. Uh, that's a concern. Uh, now you're going on the road and you're facing this Ohio State team with Justin Fields at quarterback who's been terrific. But their offensive line has been good. And they have been blowing people off the line of scrimmage all season long. It's why this offense has been tremendous. And seeing Penn State's defensive line lose the battle in the trenches in back-to-back weeks to Indiana and Minnesota, you know, teams that are pretty decent offensively but don't have that offensive line play or the potency that Ohio State does, that's a concern big time for me coming into this game. The problem for me, guys, with backing Ohio State here is – there's a tax involved. Like there's no the the, the secrets the, the cat's out of the bag. Everybody <laughs> knows this is a phenomenal Ohio State team. In normal instances, this could be a line where Ohio State's you know laying less than two touchdowns. But because they've been dominant, they've been blowing teams out left and right. Uh, all of a sudden, now you're laying more than two touchdowns with Ohio State. They've got to win in blowout fashion uh, to cash a ticket here. And it's not like Penn State is horrible. They're they're a good football team. It's just they've had some defensive leaks uh, as of late. So it's a conundrum game for me. Mm-hmm. I'm not going against Ohio State, period, end of story. I'm not. They have been that dominant. They've been that strong. And I keep recollecting in my mind, guys, of these two road underdog blowout loss spots that James Franklin and Penn State have had in recent years against uh, the team that uh, is in uh, Ed Fang's neck of the woods, Michigan. I remember the last couple of years, and Jim Harbaugh and Michigan would just destroy this team. I don't trust Penn State enough in this matchup to take them plus the points, but it's too much of a tax for Ohio State to lay the points. I do like the over in this game, and we're seeing the total uh, move up to 57.5. I agree with that. Penn State's an above-average tempo team, uh, so is Ohio State. The Penn State defense has sort of come apart at the seams. And as good as Ohio State's defense has looked this year, guys, look at who they've played lately. Rutgers, Maryland. I mean, some really, really problematic, anemic offenses at times. They're going to be tested a bit by Clifford. They're going to be tested a bit by Journey Brown, the running back for Penn State, who's been pretty good. So I think Penn State will score some in this game, and Ohio State takes care of the rest, and this game ends up over 57.5 points. 
And I think something to back up your concerns around the Penn State defense are that Indiana game, that was without their starting quarterback. Like uh, Michael Penix, I believe, just had surgery before that week. Uh, he got injured in, in the Northwestern game. So I know that their the quarterback they were using had had exposure earlier in the year. So it's not as if they were starting some scrub. But when you see that Indiana team move the ball and now you have to face Ohio State on the road, it's a pretty daunting task there. No question. Now, and Penix was good, but the good news is – you know, Penn State, I don't want to uh, give Penn State too much gr- grief and uh, criticism for that performance because Peyton Ramsey has been a multi-year starter now uh, with Indiana. Right. He's been with the program for many years. Uh, he's an experienced player. He played very well, actually, when he started against Penn State last year as well. They only lost by five in that game last year against the uh, Nittany Lions. So Peyton Ramsey's a capable quarterback, but the problem is Penn State's defense, I don't know if it's wearing down. Maybe the, uh, the depth maybe is starting to get to, again, when you get late, this late in the season, this is when defenses start to wear down. And I think you're starting to see some of that for Penn State. And unfortunately, this might be the wrong time for them to be facing this absolute juggernaut offense that Ohio State's got with Justin Fields playing at such a high level. So, you know, I'm not strong on the side, guys, but I, th- sure. I think the total going over is definitely worth a look here. All right, yeah, so yeah, you spread. Yeah, go ahead, Ed. Yeah, Ian, you bring up a really good point about Ohio State's offensive line. Uh, this unit was bad last year. Lose four of those five guys. A lot of question marks coming in, and they've they've back they're back to the the machine of of before last year uh, in terms of running the ball. They've been able to run the ball with Dobbins. So, uh, yeah, a great point there. Um, Ian, would you care to like uh, you know Ohio State and LSU have been pretty much you know in terms of performance this year the the two top teams in the nation. How would how do you view those teams and or do you view those teams as the top two in the nation? I do, but uh, LSU to me still gets the edge. Uh, they faced a gauntlet. You know, they faced some pretty good defenses as well uh, in the SEC. Not that Ohio State hasn't, but I think LSU's faced a pretty damn good schedule. Uh, when you look at who they've had to go up against, they've had to face Florida's defense, which is pretty good. They've had to face Auburn's defense, which is pretty good. They've had to face Alabama, whose defense is not good as it's been compared to recent years. There's no doubt. This is an Alabama defense that's a little bit down from where they've been in years past under Saban. But still, I mean, a tough environment like that. Uh, in uh, Tuscaloosa, and they went in there and just dominated. Don't be fooled by the final score. I mean, the first half was all LSU, and then, you know, maybe get complacent and let Alabama back into the game, but LSU was full marks uh, for that performance. So I'd have to rate LSU a little bit ahead uh, of Ohio State. But the one thing that's the one thing that would be concerning me about Ohio State and laying the 18 and a half, too, is that, you know, they have not been tested by anybody as good as Penn State in a while. They've had a lot of mediocre competition. Nebraska was supposed to be a big game for Ohio State and a good <laughs> test for uh, Ohio State. And Nebraska's just had a terrible season. Massive disappointment. You talk about one of the most disappointing teams in college football this year. Nebraska's got to be at or near the top of that list, without a doubt, with what people expected out of Scott Frost because they saw him in what, his second year at Central Florida make that <clears throat> big leap. Didn't happen for him uh, down there in Lincoln. Uh, so Ohio State, you know, this is going to be one of the big best opponents they played in weeks. We'll see if they're able to uh, get the job done. And again, they, they can't just win this game. They got to win big uh, if they're going to cash a ticket. So pretty efficient spread here at 18 and a half. But we do like the over at 57. Let's move on to Texas A&M at Georgia. Georgia is a 13 point favorite. The total here is 45 points and Georgia has rebounded well from their loss. You know, they've won four straight, but the offense has been sputtering quite a bit. Uh, so do you think that Georgia, who is number four right now in the college football playoff committee rankings, do you view them as being le- as legit as the committee does? Georgia's a – Georgia offensively, I don't know if they're fourth in the, in, in the college football. Uh, this Georgia offense has been underwhelming to say the least uh, most of the season. It's been pedestrian. Jake Fromm's not put up the numbers. Uh, that we expected the running game with Swift hasn't been as uh, dynamic and explosive, I think, as we thought it would be. Uh, It's been a Georgia team that's been kind of disappointing in that regard. And this, to me, screams like, as much as I like the over in the first game we talked about, I'd probably lean to the under uh, here in this game with uh, Georgia uh, and Texas A&M. I don't look at Georgia as a team that marches the football up and down the field this year. They've had multiple chances to show their ability to potentially do that against defenses that are worse than Texas A&M. And at times they've struggled even in those games to consistently move the football and finish off drives in the red zone with touchdowns. They've settled for field goals a lot. That's been another issue uh, for Georgia's offense uh, throughout the course of the season. And on the flip side, you know, Texas A&M too in this point spread range where they're, you know, catching nearly two touchdowns here uh, in Athens between the hedges. 
you know, that's a point spread range that I'm very leery of going against Texas A&M. And Jimbo Fisher's teams have been good, usually catching points uh, in the past. The reason I don't love A&M as much as I love the under in this game is because Kellen Mond is a mistake waiting to happen, usually against a good defense. That's just the way it is. He's a solid quarterback, but in terms of do I trust him to step up in class against the better defenses in college football? No, I do not. No, I do not, because we've seen too many instances where – moves the ball a little bit, and then pressure's on him, and he chucks the football into coverage, interception. And I worry that defensive touchdown happens for Georgia in this game against A&M who I, and, and Mond, who I think can be sometimes a mistake-prone, force the football, make the wrong read, make the bad throw at the wrong time. That's a big-time concern for me uh, in this game. So if I had to, I'd take the points with A&M because I do think Georgia's a little bit overvalued. But I like the under, which is, I think 44.5 was the total the last I checked. It's gone down a little bit from the open, but I think there's still enough value it can slide under the total. 44.5 is pretty low for college football, but uh, I don't want the over in this game. Interesting. Ian, any other games that's on the board uh, that you like for, for week, uh, what are we, 13 in college football? Yeah, <laughs> yeah week, uh, I, I like Temple plus the points at Cincy. Uh, it's a good AAC matchup here. Uh, Cincinnati, very ugly performance against a South Florida team that I think very little of. I mean, Charlie Strong is not a good coach. I don't think that's a very good program. I don't think they have any sort of quarterback play, especially with the injuries they've had to deal with there. Uh, if you can stop South Florida running the football, uh, you can beat them. And Cincinnati was just awful in that game. Very fortunate to escape with the victory and didn't come close to uh, covering the number. They were laying two touchdowns on the road in that game. They only won by three. Temple's just one of those scrappy underdogs. And I know they went through a period of time where three games in a row, their defense got absolutely carved up. But guess who they played? SMU, Memphis, and Central Florida. You know, any team in that conference is going to get carved up by SMU, Memphis, and Central Florida. Those are the three best offenses by far uh, in that AAC conference. Cincinnati's not an explosive offense. Temple has struggled with speed. Speed on the edge, a dynamic wide receivers that can get off the ball and, and, and get, you know, behind the secondary. Cincinnati doesn't have those kind of playmakers. You know, and Desmond Ritter is a ham and Egger quarterback he is i mean for cincinnati he's okay but this is not an explosive offense this is i, I think a matchup that temple can handle so definitely one of the ones i'm looking at is temple getting 10 and a half in that game all righty that is ian cameron make sure you follow him on twitter at b-o-b-a-n-o just spell it out there it's a lot easier b-o-b-a-n-o ian Good luck with the Grey Cup. I hope that everything goes well for Hamilton in that game. Hopefully, uh, both from a betting perspective and as a fan perspective. But enjoy the game. Enjoy. Good luck with all your NHL and college basketball picks, too. And hopefully, we can talk to you again here soon. All right, guys. Uh, great being on with you. Have a great day. You as well. Thank you. Covering the future. All right, big thank you to Ian Cameron once again for swinging on by and talking Week 13 at College Football and the Grey Cup. And Ed... I like having people like like Ian on because, again, I know nothing about the CFL. Um, I am probably the type of American who Canadians hate because, like, my exposure to the CFL is from when Ricky Williams was there and when Johnny <laughs> Manziel was, were there. Uh, but well, I would like to get to know long. it. No, no, it was not. Um, but, like, it seems fun. Like, I like the rules tied to it and stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to. They they say it's a better game because receivers can hit the line of scrimmage, running, and you know, it's what three downs instead of four. Yeah. So, but I I do not know much about the CFL at all. It was nice to have Ian on and school yeah. us a little bit in the storylines going on in the Grey Cup, and uh, yeah, I'll try to find time to to maybe watch a little bit of it if I can figure out what time it is on Sunday. I might have to do that, too, uh, because it could be a fun game. Not, he, he sold me on it, I guess. Uh, he sold me yeah. on it being a fun game. So uh, hopefully the, the Tiger Cats do well for Ian as a thank you for him coming on today. We'll get into our covering the future in just one second. But first, Ed and I always preach searching for the best value in betting on games. Well, look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have developed over at numberfire.com. Oddsfire is the premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first-party FanDuel data all in one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on NumberFire or at OddsFire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 
Let's dive in now to covering the future. And Ed, we talked about UMass and Northwestern earlier today, which means that we have to talk about Rutgers. I think that's kind of like, that's that's what we have to do, like legally. Uh, so you're going to talk about this Rutgers game this weekend against Michigan State. What do you see in that game? Yeah, I think at this point in the season, uh, a way to find value is to look for teams that have have kind of gone through some exceptional circumstances. Yeah. And one of those teams is Michigan State. Uh, two weeks ago, they lost to Illinois, you know, had a, a huge lead in the first half and, and, and managed to blow it uh, to Illinois. I don't think that performance was indicative of Illinois' skill level. I'm still not sold on that team at all. And the numbers really liked uh, Iowa minus 12 earlier this week. However, that line's going up to 15 and a half. Um, so obviously less value there, and it definitely scares me off once it goes through through the number of, of 14. But, you know, it was it was a bad game two weeks ago for Michigan State's defense. And it was a bad game again last week for, for against Michigan. We already talked about it. Shea Patterson had a remarkable day. Um, it, it, it was a day that he kind of, as a Michigan fan, you kind of dream of. And you can talk to any of us and be like, yeah, that was that was an exceptional performance. Um, I don't think that is really indicative of where Michigan State's defense really is. I know they have some injuries. Joe Bocci's out. One of the starting cornerbacks might not play. But they they, they really only need to kind of show up in this game against Rutgers. Um, you're get, kind of getting the ultimate cupcake offense uh, in Rutgers. They're on the third string quarterback this year. They're already near a bottom five type unit when you when you look at their numbers over the course of this year. Uh, my model really likes uh, under 44 in this game, and and I think it's right. I think the markets are overvaluing a little bit uh, the two bad performances that that Michigan State um, has had over the last two weeks. But I don't think that's really enough. Like one thing I want to check is you know the, the model that I have that calculates the total is based on yards per play, and I've talked a lot about it on the show. Like there's there's a random component to yards per play that. It, it's basically not as good a pr- predictor as something like success rate. Mm-hmm. So what I've started to do with these totals is to to look at the success rate numbers and how they compare to the yards per play. And essentially, on, for a defense, like if you're going to go with an under, you want a defense that looks better at success rate than they do by yards per play. That means they're probably better than their yards per play numbers suggest. And that's what we see here. Uh, Michigan's defense is 19th in my adjusted success rate. Yards per play, they're a little bit worse in terms of, of 25th. So they're probably a better defense. A little bit of the same story for Rutgers, uh, 98th in success rate, 98th in, in adjusted yards per play. Um, you would also like to see the same trends on offense. Uh, it's not quite the case. Michigan State's offense looks a little bit better in success rate than they do by yards per play. So 67th compared to, to 82nd. That, that unit's probably a little bit better. Um, but I do like the under here. You know, the spread's almost 20 points. This, this is the type of game that's going to slow down in the second half if Michigan State's up like 30 to nothing or 30 to seven. Um, and I feel pretty comfortable. You know, I mean, there's always this issue of Michigan State team. Like, are they giving up on Mark D'Antonio? Is it D'Antonio's last year? What is the site? You know, what is the state of, of this team? But the only way I worry about it is if the defense has given up and the, the offense hasn't. Uh, I, I don't really see that being the case. Uh, I'll take under 44 or whatever whatever FanDuel has it at this point. Uh, yeah, I don't think that even a, a defeated Michigan State defense would give up that many points to Rutgers. So I think that right. that would, if they have given up, it would just kind of bolster your point. Like it's maybe a 20-3 to three game at that point. Um, so I think that Rutgers would have a hard time moving the ball on anybody. So I think that that's a pretty valid way of looking at it. I want to talk to you, though, about your success rate model because obviously – we have to wait a little bit deeper into the year before we can have those adjusted numbers for this year. Does that give you extra confidence when you have an additional check, an additional way to look at things? You know, because you're talking about comparing it with what your yards per play model says. Does that help you have confidence in a bet now that we're at this point in the year and you can kind of check two separate methods for looking at things? Yeah, for sure. You know, like I, I think it's one of these things. If we had 100 games this season, Right. You know, yards per play and success rate would converge mm-hmm. by game 99, game game 100, right? Like, th- they'll get to the true value of, of what these units really are. But unfortunately, we don't have 100 games. And so, you know, based on work that I've done, based on work that Bill Connolly has done, we, we tend to, we want to trust, we, we just trust the success rate more. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's not, you know, it's not as prone to one play. Um, if, if you get one play wrong, or maybe even if your data is missing a play, 
that's fine if you're looking at success rate. If you're missing a 90-yard bomb in yards per play, that that can really impact things, uh, especially in a game. You know, say you're a bad offense and you you happen to be playing a good defense and you get a bomb in that in that game or you get a, a an explosive play like that. That can really change where your rank is over the course of the season. So. Um, yeah, we definitely want to look towards both numbers, knowing that the yards per play rank is probably going to drift towards what the success rate says. Okay, so we have the under on Michigan State versus Rutgers at 44. For me, I want to talk about the NFL draft because this week, FanDuel Sportsbook released the odds for each player to go as the first overall pick. And not shockingly, Joe Burrow is plus 100. That makes sense. Chase Young is plus 175. And then Justin Herbert is 3-1, to one, which I think is reflective of which teams we're picking at the top. They're probably going to want quarterback. Tua Tungavailoa is 11-1. to one, And I think that is long enough to account for the ambiguity around his injury, because we know that Tua will not play anymore this year, but his draft profile as a prospect is really good. If you look at his final year adjusted yards per attempt number, it is 13.4. That would top Kyler Murray as the highest ever for a first round pick if Tua does go in the first round. Joe Burrow's at 12.2. That ranked fourth all time, assuming that Tua is also a first round pick. Justin Herbert is a 9.8. If we look at quarterbacks taking the first round since 2000 there are 56 of them and seven of those 56 have had an AYA higher than 10.5 in their final full year in college all seven of those guys were either the first overall pick or the second overall pick and that does include Sam Bradford who had a shoulder injury during his final year his number came from his second to last year because I think he only had 68 or so pass attempts in his actual final year. If we look at the five quarterbacks who had a final year total QBR higher than 90, this is a smaller sample because the QBR data does not go back as far. There have been five quarterbacks who were taken the first round whose final year total QBR was higher than 90. Marcus Mariota was the only guy there who did not go first overall. He went second overall. And two is a 94.5 there, which leads the nation. So basically... If you have elite college stats and college evaluators, talent evaluators, say that you should go in the first round, you're going to go near the top, even if there are some questions. You know, Mariota, it was the system. Sam Bradford, it was his health. Of course, this also does apply to Joe Burrow, but he's also about a year and four months older than Tua. And if we assume that that, uh, Joe Burrow does play in the SEC championship game and makes the college football championship game, Burrow would have had at least 10 pass attempts in 28 games. Tua had 27 at a younger age, and that does matter. You, in general, older, inexperienced quarterbacks are less likely to hit than younger guys who may lack experience. And Burrow is older than Tua and has a similar level of experience. So if Tua are fully healthy... I would think he'd be favored over Burrow to be the first overall pick. And to me, he'd be a big step above Herbert as well. Adam Schefter reported this week that the expectation is that Tua will be able to resume athletic activities in about three months, which would be the middle of February. Uh, The NFL draft is in, in April. Tua can start throwing once again in the spring. And that's a lot better timeline than what we had heard earlier for Tua. You know, everyone's talking about Bo Jackson. This is a different situation. It sounds like the timeline for Tua is a lot better. And that could always go awry because this is a major surgery. And it's not a lock that that teams clear him medically. But I think this number really does account for that at 11-1. to If Tua were fully healthy, I think that he'd be the favorite to go first overall. And I think getting him at 11-1 to is prudent because there is a potential for that number to be trimmed massively if his recovery goes as planned based on the timeline that Schefter laid out. So 11-1 to 1 to me seems to be a really good number for Tua Tungavailoa to go first overall. Uh, Ed, any thoughts on this one? I know that it's it's a long way away well, to talk I mean, NFL I, draft. I, I agree with everything you said. I, I agree that there's value at 11-1 with Tua. Um, what I don't necessarily agree is whether he would be the favorite if he were healthy. I think Burrow has been okay. so good this year. Um, I, I just think there's a lot of hype with that. Uh, unwarranted, but I think there's a lot of hype with with Burrow, and he's done it. He's certainly done it this year, but he doesn't have a track record in years past. Um, yeah. You know, couldn't beat out Dwayne Haskins for the job last year. Transferred, took over LSU. wasn't particularly good for half the season. Was better second half of last year, but nothing, nothing like 
what he's been able to do this season. So if I'm the Cincinnati Bengals and I'm looking for a quarterback, I want the guy who's been accurate for longer. So Tua definitely makes sense there. Uh, I'm not a huge Justin Herbert fan. I'm pretty sure I've talked about that on this on this show. Yeah. Uh, he's had a great year. Don't get me wrong. <clears throat> but I'm always a little cautious when the first thing you say about a quarterback is he's 6'4 and a great athlete. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I mean, the only thing I, I think there is value in this bet. I, I always hate betting on things that involve the judgment of human beings. True. I'd rather have it be the bounce of a ball. Yep. As, as frustrating as that can be at sometimes. <laughs> um, but, but Hey, yeah, no, I think it's a fun thing to think about. And, uh, I, I like what you're thinking is, uh, Robert Mays on the Ringer NFL show has this theory that Justin Herbert is too tall to play quarterback, which I find what? hilarious. I, it's, it's, it's a joke. Oh. It's like, it's like but, a very clear joke. Like he, he's too tall. Not. Um, and I, I find that really funny. Robert's awesome. Um, so I always enjoy that, that. And I think of that whenever Justin Herbert is brought up. <laughs> is that, is, is the data point, uh, Brock Osweiler? Is that, is that how, why he's too yeah. tall? Yeah, <laughs> probably. Um, but I think that when you compare Herbert to, Burrow and Tunga Vailoa. I don't think they're in the same tier personally. Um, and to back up your point about NFL teams buying into hype, that's what we saw with Mitchell Trubisky when he went second overall. Was <laughs> he was a one year starter, and Burrow effectively is a one year starter. Like he he started in the past, but yeah. from a good data perspective, it's it's a one year sample. Whereas with Tua, right. it's you know all of well, last year too. Well, Trubisky played one year at North Carolina. He was mm -hmm. older. And he the was thing, 22, I believe, yeah. And the thing that, that really gets me is that he couldn't beat out Marquise Williams for the job the year before. Right. And Marquise right. Williams, last time I checked, was not on an NFL roster. Right. So, you know, either the coaches in North Carolina are crazy or... But, you know, I mean, Trubisky was very good last year. Yeah. It wasn't great, but he was very, you know, he was very good. Uh, he hasn't been good this year. No. And now they're pinning the benching on an injury, which I love. Yep. The intrigue of that. You know, I didn't I, I thought he just got benched and then I looked at the injury report. It's like, oh. This I mean the, the the conversation that Matt Nagy the animated conversation that Matt Nagy was having with him on the sideline did not seem like, hey, I'm pulling you because you're hurt. It seemed more like <laughs> You're not setting you out to sea, young man. You've had a good run. <laughs> enjoy your voyage from here it will not be with us like that's that's the vibe it gave off it did not give off hey your hip hurts uh so that was a, it was weird um like i i feel bad for trubisky at this point i've never been a believer in him but i feel right. bad because like obviously that'd be tough to deal with and stuff but uh the thought process behind taking him second overall was pretty wild to yeah me. it was pretty wild so, is he gonna play this week uh i saw a report that they had not determined yet his practice availability for Wednesday. And my guess would be that he does play because they're facing the Giants, and the Giants' defense yeah. is quite bad. And if you're going to give him a bounce-back spot, you do it at home against the Giants, where they're, I think, like six-and-a-half-point favorites. Yeah. Uh, so I would bet that he plays. Yeah, and the market get the, seems the confidence booster. And the market seems to suggest that he's going to play if this this number is at seven. At least right. my numbers that include all of Trubisky's stats suggest a seven right. point. And if you look at what Chase Daniel did relative to Trubisky last year and what Chase Daniel did in that Oakland game, right. your number is correct to have more value in Trubisky than Chase Daniel. I know Trubisky's become a meme, but Chase Daniel's not a good quarterback, and we should keep that in mind as right. well that is all that we have for today once again we're back again tomorrow though to talk with donnie seymour about week 12 of the nfl to get that podcast make sure you subscribe to covering the spread you can find that wherever you get your podcast and if you're listening on apple podcasts make sure you rate and review the podcast as well thank you to those of you who have already done so ed what's going on for you this week over at the power rank uh, just focused on getting my newsletter out tomorrow. Uh, sign that, sign up for that at thepowerrank.com. You'll get a, a free sample of of predictions I usually say for paying members of the site. And uh, I talked with Michael Salfino on the podcast. That's going to go up. Uh, well, by the time this is up, that'll that'll be up. But he, uh, I actually learned of him when Cade Massey was on my podcast because Michael Salfino asked Cade to to come up with Massey Peabody, uh, which yeah. is 
which is a system that I that I really respect. So that was a really interesting conversation. Uh, that's on the Football Analytics Show this week. And I know Michael Salvino because of fantasy stuff. So that's interesting. I'll check that right. out. Uh, the Football Analytics Show is where you can find that and all of Ed's work over at thepowerrank.com. You can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank as well. I am at Jim Sanis on Twitter, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. If you are a DFS player, we'll have our week... The week 12, ooh, can't keep track. Week 12 NFL DFS podcast going up tomorrow. If you like watching things on YouTube, we are streaming those live on YouTube. We'll stream that one tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning. And you can check that out on the FanDuel YouTube page. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald for working the video side of things for today and chopping up clips for the at FanDuel Twitter account. Thank you, Cal, for that. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. And thank you to Ian Cameron as well for spreading his knowledge about week 13 of college football. Good luck with your bets, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.